Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm getting too old to preach at Desperation. That's what I've been told, all right? So they've, um, they put me out to pastor. So you are coming to Desperation, right? Right? Next week? It's going to be awesome. Desperation is our youth conference that we have every year. 16th year we've had it. And it's uh, good to be with you tonight, by the way. We'll take good care of your kids when they come. And your, and your youth pastor, we'll send her back in one piece. And she's, uh, she just told me she's doing a 5 a.m. bus ride with 40 kids. That, we need to fast and pray for that, right? I mean, that's a big deal. Come on. And it's good to be in Texas where I can understand people, right? Where, where we, 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 you know, we speak the Queen's English correctly here. So I appreciate that. I lived in Texas most of my life. I'm a Louisiana native, but I lived in Texas uh, for 15, 16 years, so I learned Texas English, all right? Way, so it's good to be with you. And I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm so excited about this topic that Pastor Mark asked me to speak on. I know you're in a, 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 a series on spiritual gifts and on the Holy Spirit. And, and I, he asked me to speak on the gift of prophecy. And this is one of my favorite topics to preach on. It's just, uh, I think it's, it is super important that we understand this spiritual gift. So I'm going to take you through a lot of scriptures. So open up your Bible with me, and I'm going to talk to you about the gift of prophecy. And by the way, I love what the Lord's doing at your church. I, got, I just love the building you're about to build. This is a beautiful piece of property. And when I found out there were bass in the lake behind the church, it uh, automatically sealed that I'm going to come back. I want to come back and fish, all right? I, very few places that I get invited to where you can fish on the property. I mean, that's the big deal. I love that. Uh, so turn to with me in 1 Corinthians, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And then we're going to be in several different places. And the reason I'm sharing so many different areas of Scripture with you is I want to show you that the entire Bible talks about this spiritual gift. It is, it is the most important thing of all the spiritual gifts. In my opinion, prophecy and healing are the two gifts that were emphasized a lot by Paul, by James, by John, and, and because the early church saw these gifts expressed in such a powerful way, it changed the whole trajectory of the church when these spiritual gifts were operating in the building. So I want to show this to you, okay? 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1, then verses 3, it says, Follow the way of love and eagerly, eagerly, passionately, desperately seek spiritual gifts. In other words, when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we should ask for is, Lord, use me today. Let these spiritual gifts operate in my life. He says, the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. And I love this phrase in the NIV, especially of all the gifts. And he talks about all of them, and a lot of them, in, in chapter 12 and then again in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. All the, a lot of the spiritual gifts are talked about there. But Paul says to the church of Corinth, Make sure of all the gifts, especially this one, especially the gift of prophecy. Look at verse 3. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, their encouragement, and their comfort. Now, let me give you a really easy definition of prophecy, because I think many times we have made the definition, the understanding of these gifts way too complicated. This is very simple to me. So let me give you a very easy definition, okay? That, and, I, and this is from my own time, all right? It's the speaking of merely human words. All right, that's just, in other words, we're talking. And, and by the way, God prophesies in Texan. I want you to encourage that, all right? <laughs> Texan, he does this, all right? There's Greek, Hebrew, and Texan, and God uses all three languages, all right? So the speaking of merely human words to report something that God brings to your mind. It's that simple. God brings things to our attention and he uses our voice, our words, our language to communicate those things to other people. This is what makes following Jesus so exciting. The Holy Spirit, active in us as believers, makes following Jesus really exciting work. This is not a boring exercise. This is God, in, in, in other words, God has chosen to use us to do his work on the earth. That's fascinating to me. In Athens, Texas, Henderson County, all across this region, the Holy Spirit has chosen you and me to do His work in this part of the world. And there are no plan Bs. He needs us to do this work. Let me show you this in the Old Testament. Numbers. Go to, if you can find Numbers in less than 30 seconds, without, that, you're, you're going to heaven, okay? Find the book of Numbers. Guaranteed going to heaven if you can find numbers in less than 30 seconds, all right? Go. All right, no, no, I'm joking. All right, Numbers chapter 11. Just take my word for it. This, this scripture is in the Bible, okay? So this is Moses when he hears a report 
that some prophets are speaking out in the camp where he's taken them from Egypt to the promised land. And there are some people that are speaking on behalf of the Lord. They're prophesying. And some people are really upset by all this. Listen to what Moses said. This is 4,000 years ago. Moses says, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. I wish they would all do this. Now think about the type and shadow, the, almost like the prophetic idea that Moses could look ahead thousands of years and see the Holy Spirit at active and work at everyone. He said, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on the, upon them all, everyone. All right, are you following now? Now, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit has come. Now, last Sunday was the Sunday of Pentecost, right? It was, the, it was uh, around the world, the church was celebrating the arrival of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church last Sunday. Last Sunday was the Sunday of Pentecost. Here's what was happening. Acts chapter 2, verse 16 says uh, there's a, a big misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit. People are being filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and so Peter's trying to explain what was going on here. He says, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says, in the last days, now, now he's, he's, this is Joel chapter 2, if you want to go back to the Old Testament and read this, he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Remember, what, what did Moses say? I wish the Spirit were on everyone. That was Moses. Thousands of years later, Joel said it. Now Peter is saying it. He was saying, I wish, he said, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Listen, there are, there's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit, by the way. Did you know that the same Holy Spirit? I know your kids just walked out the door over here to go to that. The same Holy Spirit that's working in this room is right now working right there. There's no substitute for the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that is on adults will be at desperation next week. The Holy Spirit wants, is, is, works in us irregardless of age and experience. The Holy Spirit is no respecter of ages, right? The Holy Spirit comes. He says, and he listen to this, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams because we sleep more. Come on, all the old guys in the room, right? <laughs> right? That, that's me. I'm pro-nap. I'm, I'm, I'm for naps. <laughs> so, old, young men will see visions because they're, they're just going really fast. Old men will dream dreams. But even on my servants, listen to this, both men and women. This, this was radical, that the Holy Spirit would come upon men and women in equal measure. This totally changed the face of the world when, they, when he said this. He says, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. This is fast. All, all of this, all, the whole Bible is pointing to this spiritual gift being used in an extravagant way in the local church. All right, one more to you, okay? First Thessalonians. And in verse five, chapter 5, verse 19, listen to this. It says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Don't put it out. And he says, do not treat prophecies with contempt. Now, some of you may have been raised in a church tradition where spiritual gifts were maybe uh, you weren't taught what they were or you were told that they were, had gone away with the apostles or that something was wrong with people who welcomed the work of the Spirit. I'm married to a good Southern Baptist girl. She had never heard of the gift of prophecy when I married her. And I grew up uh, where the gift of prophecy was all, I saw it all the time. I think I, I heard people speaking in tongues before I could speak English myself. I mean, I just, I grew up in a very Pentecostal environment. So it wasn't new to me, but it's new to some people. You've never heard about this. So I'm going to make it very, very simple tonight because this is a gift when I leave here this weekend, it's my desire and my hope that every one of you start welcoming this, spirit, this gift into your life and start using it. This is a spiritual gift you can use right now, tonight, before you go to bed. I promise you, the Holy Spirit wants to use you with this spiritual gift before you go to bed tonight. It's that simple and that powerful. I'm going to explain this to you in just a moment, okay? All right, here's the first thing I want you to catch, all right? Prophecy is encouraging. It's encouraging, uh, and, and 1 Corinthians just told us that. It is to strengthen and encourage people. Now listen, there will be times that this is how simple this is. And I'm not trying to make it so simple that it, I want you to just understand how profoundly easy this is. Let me ask you a question, okay? This is not a trick question. When you're around a stranger or your spouse or your kids or any other human being, another human being, and you feel the urge or the desire or the inclination, whatever word you want to use, let's just think, you, have, you just have a, a slight sense 
that they need to be encouraged. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the devil wants to encourage people? Okay, this is a very simple question. All right? this is, I'm, I'm not a trick question. Do you think the accuser of our souls, what, the one who steals, kills, and destroys, wants to encourage any of us? So when I feel a, an unction, a, a, a desire, any kind of thing to go encourage someone, I suspect it's the Holy Spirit because it's not the enemy. It's, and even, listen, here's what I tell people all the time. Even if it's just your flesh, and you're totally just in your flesh, if you, by working in the flesh, encourage another person, God will not get mad at you. <laughs> this is the gift you can't mess up. If your desire is to encourage another human, let's just suppose, I, I just think it's almost always the Holy Spirit, but even if it's not, it's going to be okay. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to look for the Holy Spirit's opportunity to encourage you. This is why this is a spiritual gift you can use before you go to bed tonight. Let me tell you about marriage, okay? Every married couple that I've ever counseled, and I've, I've, I've counseled hundreds of married couples, the number one way to rebuild broken marriages is when two people begin to encourage one another. When this gift of prophecy is active in a married couple's life, their chances of survival and thriving go up by 900% in my opinion. When Pam and I, my wife, we've been married 28 years. We got married when we were 12. I know that uh, you see that, right? And it was the scandal of the seventh grade, but we have made it. We're doing great. But we have made it 28 years later. You know why that she's still my best friend? She is the closest person that I have in my life. I'm still crazy about her, and she likes me a lot. You know why? Because we, young, when we were a young married couple, people taught us the gift of prophecy. And so we just choose to speak life into one another. We choose to speak, and then we speak truthfully too. Now, we have some strong disagreements from time to time. We don't ever argue. We just strongly disagree from time to time, all right? And sometimes it gets really passionate. But that's very rare, quite honestly. We have honest, sincere conversations all the time. We're truthful to one another. But it's all filtered through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We want to encourage one another. We've chosen to encourage one another. So when I feel tempted to encourage Pam, I give in every time. That's what I'm trying to help you with. Are you seeing how simple this is? The next time you're in the supermarket or at a gas station or just around a random stranger who you may not like, the boss you don't like, the next time you're tempted to encourage someone, give in and see if the Holy Spirit doesn't use your simple words to break down spiritual barriers in other people's lives. Listen, there have been times when I'm around jerks and I don't know, I know that's shocking. And most of them are members of my church, all right? So I'm just telling you. We have jerks. We allow jerks to attend my church. We don't let them stay jerks, but we allow jerks to come, all right? Y'all let, let jerks come here, everyone? Okay, don't look at that person. Don't look. <laughs> I mean, knuckleheads, all right? That's a better word. Y'all allow knuckleheads to come here, okay? All right, the next time you're around, a, let me tell you this story real quickly. I had a, a guy at another church that I once a, attended that, uh, well, it was a gateway, okay? It was a gateway in South Lake. That's where I was, all right? So <laughs> this guy, anytime I would speak or teach or train, he would wait after the meeting and made sure that he corrected any mistakes that I had. And I so appreciated him the first three times he did it, but 30 <laughs> times later, it really got annoying, all right? And, and so I remember one time I was so aggravated with him, and I was ready to really have the talk, you know, the pastor talk with him, say, look, stop encouraging me so much. Go encourage another pastor down the road more than you're encouraging me. I was ready to have that talk with him. And this guy walks up to me, and it's just like that. The Holy Spirit showed me something about him, and I said, and he was coming up to me with an angry face that he always came up to me, and I said, I said, you know what? I was praying for you this morning, and I saw a little boy about nine or ten years old, under a bed. And this little boy was praying that his father would not hit him again. And the Lord heard your prayer. And is that you? Was that little boy you? I just said this to him just like that. He goes, oh, 
melted in front of me. Well, he had made up his mind he was going to never let a man in a position of authority hurt him ever again. And so he made up his mind, I'm going to go correct Brady. I'm going to go correct him every time. He would walk up to me and just correct me. And I got tired of it until the Lord showed me how to break that down. So let me tell you something. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm never going to hurt you. I want you to look at me. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm your pastor. I'm here to help you. I will always be here to help you. It totally changed our relationship. That was years ago. Now, when I go back to Gateway now, I've been gone from Gateway for 10 years. But when I go back there now, he's the one standing in line. Every time I preach, I'll walk off the stage, and there'll be a line of people to say hello to me. He's always in the line, hugging my neck, grabbing me. Oh, Pastor Brady, it's so good to see you. How did that happen? Because I chose to encourage him one day. I'm just telling you, I just gave in to the temptation to encourage the guy. And the Holy Spirit used that to make a friend. I'm just telling you, there are people that are difficult in your life right now. I'm giving you a prophetic word right now. There are some of you in this room, you have not had a breakthrough with a difficult person because you have not asked the Holy Spirit to give you a prophetic word for them. Prophesy to them. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Let's just be honest. You can't fix them. You can't fix them, but the Holy Spirit can. And I'm just giving you that tonight to take home and just try it out and just see if the Lord doesn't use that to break down some barriers. Or here's the second thing, all right? Prophecy is supernatural. It's a miracle. What I just told you is a miracle story. I had no idea that he was nine or ten. How, how did I know that? A nine or ten-year-old boy hiding under a bed, hoping his dad. How would I know that? Let me read this to you, okay? 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24. But if an unbeliever, knuckleheads, people that don't know Jesus, if they, if they if, or someone else who does not understand comes in while everyone's prophesying, Think about if, if somebody, those back doors open right now and a hundred people from Athens, Texas walked in there who've never been in church before and they saw all of us in this room encouraging one another with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul's trying to say. What if they all walked in and they saw all of you encouraging one another, strengthening one another, comforting one another? He says, will he not be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare? I just told you this story. Of him, the secrets of his heart got laid bare right in front of me. And I prophesied to him, I'm not here to hurt you. Your dad hurt you, but I didn't hurt you. I'm not here to hurt you. It's suddenly the secrets of his heart got revealed, and he realized that God loved him. And he says, so he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. This is a, this is a, a sign, listen, one of the signs that God is at work in a church is when the spirit of prophecy is present. When you see a group of people encouraging one another, and strengthening one another, comforting one another, it is a sign that the Holy Spirit has formed a church, that God is at work in the church. Isn't that powerful? That's strong. This is the Bible talking to us here, okay? All right, let me tell you one more story. I, got, I, got, I can tell a hundred stories, thousand stories about prophecy. Let me tell you this story. There was a guy at Gateway Church who's on staff there now. But for 20 years, he was the chief bellhop at, 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 the, at the Hyatt there in, by the airport. You know, there's two Hyatts at the airport now, the old one, the old Hyatt. He was the chief bellhop. In other words, for 20 years, he worked the lobby. He was the guy in charge of getting people's bags to their rooms and parking cars. He did all that. He worked his way up till he was overseeing the whole thing. One day, a group of pastors from Guatemala flew into the airport and checked into the hotel, about 10 or 15 of them. They were all from Guatemala, and they were there to meet and have a three-day meeting in the hotel. One of the pastors walks by my friend. He's the bellhop. He has his bellhop outfit on. Walks by him, and the Lord says, go to him and tell him, dig. One word, dig. And my friend, who had just heard a teaching like this, he said, I'm not going to go tell that guy that. I'm not going to do it. And the Lord said, go tell him one word, dig. He said, well, I'm not going to do it. So the next day, the pastors are walking by. And the Holy Spirit says to him, go tell that pastor, dig. That night, he couldn't sleep. The Lord said, you're going to tell him, dig, or you're not going to sleep again, ever. <laughs> you're going to tell him. This is a, the Lord will do this, all right? So I'm just telling you, you don't wrestle with God about this. The third day, they're about to check out. The guy is bringing his bags down from his room about to get in his, the, the van and go back to Guatemala. 
Does, my friend hadn't slept all night long. <clears throat> he pulls the pastor over. He doesn't even know if he speaks English very well. He says, excuse me, sir. I work here at the hotel. I know you're a pastor. I'm also a Christ follower. For three days, I've had this one word to give you. It's not even a sentence. It's one word. And the pastor goes, well, tell me, what's the word? He goes, because he, yeah, he's just going to look stupid, right? If this is not good. He goes, dig. And the pastor says, excuse me, what did you say? He said, dig. The guy just melts in front of him. He said, well, why are you telling me this? And he said, let me tell you why that word is so important. And he says, I just left my church. And I'm telling you this because you're about to build a building. He said, uh, I w I'm a pastor in a small village in Guatemala. And our church is growing really fast. And we don't have any more room. And I just met with my elders on Sunday night. And we've all been fasting and praying this entire week. Because we have a decision to make. To either go buy some property, a lot like what y'all have done. Buy some property outside of town. Or we have this piece of property that backs up to a mountain. And we can dig out the back of the mountain and make our building bigger. We don't know what to do. It, we have these two choices in front of us. So we've been praying all week long to find, Lord, what is your will for our church? Should we go buy this property? It's going to make it hard for people because they walk out there. They don't have cars. They're going to have to walk a mile to our church if we buy that property. Or we can spend a little extra money and dig out the back of the mountain. And the bellhop at Hyatt walks up to him and says, dig. <laughs> dig. It's a true story. That's supernatural. How does that happen? If you don't believe in God, okay, how, that's not a coincidence. I can't explain that kind of thing to you. I can tell you a thousand stories like that where the Lord, that's, you know how strengthening that is and comforting that is to that guy to know that a bellhop in Dallas, Fort Worth, that the Lord cares so deeply about that little church in Guatemala that he would speak to a bellhop in Hyatt in Dallas. That's supernatural, that's strengthening, that's encouraging, that's comforting. That's God, that's New Testament stuff. Yes. The book of Acts kind of stuff. Yes. That's the Holy Spirit. The, and this, is, this is a bellhop. This guy barely graduated high school. He has no college degree. He's not, he's not an advanced thinker or learner. He would say that about himself. He's a hardworking guy. He would say, listen, God used me to change the destiny of his church. He wants to use you. He's looking for usable people who will say yes. Who will just say yes. They're doing crazy stuff like that. That's crazy stuff. And very few people have the courage to do that. He did it. Now, I can tell you a hundred stories of people making complete fools of themselves, too. I mean, but that doesn't keep me from trying. You just say yes. Just be obedient. Give in to the temptation to encourage somebody. All right, here's the last thing. So prophecy is encouraging. Prophecy is supernatural. But prophecy is also is listening. And this is the point that I really want to land on tonight. Prophecy is listening. Let me, talk, let me talk to you really practically about this. Let me tell you, the people who are best at this are the people who spend a lot of time listening to the Lord. Let me show you this. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, my sheep listen to, to my voice. They listen to my voice. This is one of the trademarks of a Christ follower is that they are committed to hearing the voice of God. Well, Pastor Reddy, what does the voice of the Lord look like? What does it sound like? Let me, let me give you an example. People ask me that all the time. Well, I don't know if I'm hearing God. My 18-year-old my son just came in and said, he said, now, Dad, I hear you talking about this. How do I know what the voice of the Lord sounds like? And here's what I said. I said, Abram, let me tell you a story. When I was a little bit older than Abram, I started dating his mother. Started dating, uh, you know, we started dating. And I said, now, this is, I know this is going to sound really old, okay, but this is, there used to be phones that you couldn't know, you didn't know who was calling you when it rang, all right, so <laughs> do you remember that? Can anybody else remember that? You didn't know. No caller ID. It just rang. It was a noise. And so there was no way to tell who was calling until you picked up the phone. There was no face, no picture, no number, nothing. It was so fun. It was much more fun back then because it was a total, you never knew, yeah. right? And I shared a line with my aunt and uncle across the street. <laughs> You remember party lines? Anybody else remember those? All right. So if it rang once, it was for my aunt and uncle across the street. If it rang twice, it was for us, our house, right across the street. We shared a line. This is a true story. This is like, I know you're going to think I'm 100 years old, but this is not that long ago. 
This is a true story. So it would ring twice. I could hear my aunt pick up the phone because she wanted to hear what we were talking about. It was, so we heard. You could hear each other's conversations across the street. All right, all right, enough of that. But I told my son this story. He's going, Dad, how old are you? Like, I know Alexander Graham Bell. I knew him. All right, I didn't. So <laughs> it's not true. So I, I said to him, all right, when, I, when my, your mom and I were dating and I picked up the phone, I said, she, you know, when we were only been dating once, you know, one or two or three weeks, I, I, had a, I had a lot of girls I was interested in. Okay, this is back then, okay, not now, but back then. So I, it took me a moment to realize, who am I talking to? I mean, when I first started dating her, I didn't know who, I couldn't recognize her voice. But then when she became exclusive in my life, and we talk more regularly, I learned to, hear, to recognize her voice. Let me tell you about hearing God. When God becomes exclusive in your life, and you talk to him a lot, you will learn to hear his voice. That's it. I can't tell you any other way. There's no magic formula. I can't wave a wand over you. But when God becomes so central to your life, when God, bec- if, you, if he's one of a multitude of voices that you allow into your life on a, on a high level, I'm talking about really influence in your life, if God's one of the voices, then you'll never hear his voice very well. Too, cl- too many voices. But when I'm committed to hearing God, and I watch movies and I listen to music. I'm not saying I'm a prude about these things. I'm just saying the voice of the Lord is the most important thing in my life. Then I learn to hear his voice because I talk to him a lot and I listen for him a lot. And just like now, I, 28 years later, we dated for we made 31 years. She's been my girlfriend. I have no trouble recognizing Pam's voice. And now we can be in a crowded room across with thousands of people at New Life Church, and she can look across a crowded room and give me like one little look. I can, it's like a paragraph of what I know, what she's saying and thinking. Because we know each other. We just, we're best friends. That's what happens over time. And then I said, then I said to my son, okay, so if that's not enough for you, let me tell you what else you do. I said, I, I gave him some Psalms to read. I'm gonna give this to you as well, okay? Psalm 1, Psalm 22. Psalm 23, Psalm 51, Psalm 91. I gave him all those psalms. I gave him a lot of iconic psalms. Okay, those are real easy. I said, read those and then pray back what you just read. And learn to have, get, so have, get into a conversation through the scriptures. Pray, read the scriptures and pray the scriptures. It's one of the things we teach at Desperation. We teach this to our kids, our students at New Life. Read the Bible, pray it back. And let me give you an example. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Father, thank you that you're a good shepherd to me. You're the Father in heaven that I need. And Lord, I know I have desires for a lot of things, but let my desire be for you and you alone. See, I read the scriptures. So I just heard God speak to me through the scriptures, and then I prayed it back to him. See, this is how you engage the conversation. So you're saying, well, how do I get into that conversation? Well, read the Bible out loud and we pray it back. Because if the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, if it's, if it's God-breathed, as Paul said, the, spritu- the Scriptures are God-breathed, right? Do we believe that? It, we believe that here, right? That the Scriptures are given to us by the Holy Spirit, breathed on by God. So if you'll read those Scriptures out loud and then speak back to them, notice what happened. You just got into a conversation with God through the Bible. So I read the script and read them out loud. I told Abram, don't just read it in your mind. Read it out loud. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Like, so I read it out loud, and then I pray it back to him. And then I got into this. Then I, now you're in a holy conversation, Abram. This is what I'm telling my son. And if you'll do that for a period of time, you'll begin to find that as you walk through the day and you hear these little nudges, that it will remind you of the scriptures that you've read. You'll, feel, you'll know what God's voice sounds like. Don't get in a hurry. This is not like a magic formula, okay? Like, magically hear God. No, you got to work at it. It's a discipline. It's a passionate pursuit to hear God's voice. Don't be, and he's got to be exclusive, all right? If you make God one of the many gods in your life, you'll never hear his voice because he says, he says this, I know them and they follow me. I know them and they follow me. And the sheep won't listen to it. You can read the rest of it in John chapter 10 on your own because he goes into a great explanation about this that you're going to hear other sheep shepherds too and other people are going to try to lure you away. But my sheep will know 
my voice. Isn't that powerful? That's what I'm here tonight to pray for you about. Some of you are so hungry to hear the Lord's voice, and I have good news for you. He wants to speak to you. Every one of you. This is not a, an exclusive club. This is, this is I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. This is, the, this is the realization of Joel's prophecy. The New Testament church is going to be a place where the Holy Spirit is poured out on everyone, and everyone can prophesy. So I'm giving you tonight, if you'll take on the challenge, ask the Holy Spirit to give you an encouraging word for someone before you go to bed tonight. Well, what's it going to sound like? It'll probably be, like, I, I, can't, I can tell you one more quick story. I remember one time uh, there was a young woman that Pam and I had in our life that she was around us, and the Lord just tell, told me to say, the Lord really loves you. The Lord really loves you. I kept hearing this for this girl. I said, no, come on, Lord. I mean, that's, that's so easy. That's so basic. You know, God loves you and has a great plan for your life. Well, that's true, though. It's true. And I just remember looking at her, and I had had a lot of conversations with this young woman, heavy, deep, spiritual conversations with this young woman. But I said to her one day, I said, you know, I just, I want to tell you something. God really loves you. It just melted something inside of her. She just needed to hear that. So it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be detailed. Just whatever impression that you have for someone, encourage them, strengthen them, comfort them. Just to act, give in to the temptation to, do, to prophesy. It's that simple and that easy. And this is, this is found throughout the Bible. The Holy Spirit is a speaking God looking for listening people who will speak for him. The Holy speaking God, listening people, and obedient voices. That's all prophecy is. Does that make sense? I'm going to pray for you right now. Can I just pray over you and for you? Ask the Holy Spirit to come right now. I've been teaching my church a, a three-word prayer. Three words. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Now, I know when we say yes to Jesus that the Holy Spirit is with us. I'm not here to wrestle with you theologically about any of that. I believe the Holy Spirit is with us. But when I pray that prayer, I'm recognizing the Holy Spirit in my life, and I'm welcoming him. Is the Holy Spirit with me all the time? Of course he is. But I can also ignore him. Just like you can, you can have someone that's with you all the time and you can ignore them or you can embrace them. It's true that the Holy Spirit is with us, but it's also true that we can ignore the Holy Spirit. And so this prayer for me is an invitation for the Holy Spirit to come near. I recognize, Holy Spirit, that you're right here with me. Now come, Holy Spirit, come near to me, speak to me. So can we just pray that prayer if you're comfortable with that? Just say, come, Holy Spirit. Just come, welcome the person and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's that simple. Come, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. The person, the power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you today. I pray over this room right now. And all those who will be listening online or watching this or Father, over the years, would you use these words to stir up the gifts of the Spirit in us? Come, teach us how to strengthen and encourage and comfort the people around us. Holy Spirit, do your work.